Well, happy Sabbath, everybody. It is good to be here. It's been a while since I've uh, been up here. A little nervous, so pray for me. <laughs> uh, but it's good. It's good to be up here. It's really an honor. Anytime I can uh, speak the word of God, it's really, uh, it really is an honor. So I know uh, Pastor John Carlo. He's graduating today. So I just, uh, if he sees this, I want to uh, congratulate him and his family, and it's a great accomplishment. So I know there's going to be a party. And our family will be out of town, but uh, I'm sure it'll be really nice. So, um, and I also want to just uh, thank everybody that participated in BBS this year and everybody that helped. I know they mentioned it, and I really enjoyed that video. Um, I know my wife probably doesn't want me to say this, but uh, she, uh, she gives all the glory to God, but I believe this is her seventh or eighth year and um, doing this, and I know it's really um, planted a lot of seeds and done a lot of good things, but the glory goes to God, but I know she puts a lot of work into it, and she loves it, but I just wanted to give her a special. And thank you again to everyone else, and it was a blessing. Did uh, people enjoy the week that came? So um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, The nature nuggets, the food, the food is great, always is. But I really love the theme this year of birds because birds, I think it's a good reminder for a lot of things. The main thing is that God loves us and he takes care of us. And so speaking on that, I wanted to continue along that theme today. So that's the title. Today is Behold the Fowls of the Air. And does anybody know what kind of bird this is here? A love bird, yes. So if you remember the lady that came and showed us the animals, they, um, she took a lovebird around and she put it on her fingers. And I really enjoyed that. That was great. But again, I'll rem- uh, just to say it again, birds are, are a power- powerful reminder of God's love for us as both creator and redeemer. Okay, so we'll get started. Can anybody tell me, or uh, does anybody recognize this picture? Who says? Uh, go ahead. The brothers, yeah, we're getting there. (laughs) The Wright brothers, exactly. This is a very famous picture of when the first flight that happened uh, with the Wright brothers. And really what they did was amazing because what they did was it changed history or changed the future forever. And it really um, was one of the most important events, events of history. So this happened in December of 1903, December 17th to be exact. And so they were the first people to successfully uh, pilot an engine-powered airplane. And today we kind of take that for granted, but back then it was not not heard of. They they learned to glide and they could do things like that, but to actually have an engine-powered airplane and, and pilot it successfully was just amazing. And so in the picture here, if you look, on the, on, it would be on your right, the man standing there, that's uh, Wilbur. And Wilbur is the older brother, and who's actually on the plane flying it is uh, Orville, and that's the younger brother. And so they snapped this picture the very first time the flight went off. And from what I was reading, they went about 120 feet, and they were in the air for about 12 seconds. So if you think about that... Um, Maybe we're not that impressed with it, but in 120 feet, I was trying to give a visual. That's about 40 yards. And so if you think about a football field, it's less than half of a football field. And they're only up in the air for 12 seconds. But why was that, why was that so um, pivotal? Why was that so important? Part of it was because they were told uh, from a young age that flying was impossible. And the fact that they did this, even if it was for a short distance for, and for a short time, they proved that it was possible. And so the industry kind of took off from there. And to give you kind of a brief history of the uh, Wright brothers, it's a very uh, interesting story. But they were from Dayton, Ohio. And uh, the older brother, Wilbur, he wanted to go to Yale. He was 18 years old, and he was ready to go to school. And he was playing hockey, and he got into an accident where he got hit in the mouth with a hockey stick, and it knocked all his teeth out. And for some reason, I I couldn't really figure out why, 
This changed his plans. He decided, I don't want to go to school. I don't have teeth. I don't know what it was, but he didn't want to go to school. So he decided, him and his brother, to uh, start a uh, bicycle shop right there in Ohio. And what they started doing, they, they always had this interest in planes, but when they had this bicycle shop and they had means to, to different things, they started to build different models of airplanes. They were designing them, building them. And what they started to do was take those planes and they'd have them shipped down to North Carolina. Maybe you've heard of Kitty Hawk, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And they picked that place because it was some dunes and there was some air and, and they're kind of out in the, uh, not around a lot of people. So they picked that as a good spot to, to fly. But they had a lot of um, uh, times where it didn't work out. But again, on this day, uh, December 17, 1903, it did work out. And the design that you see there, it's called the biplane, B-I, so you see the two wings. So that was a design that actually uh, worked. So, um, and I think flying is just a very fascinating thing. I, uh, even today as an adult, especially when I was a kid, when a plane would come by, I would stop and look. And I was driving the other day in, by an uh, airport and the plane was just really low. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but just to see it, it's just, it's just breathtaking, I think, to, even at this age. Um, and, uh, and they're popular. The uh, air shows, I think there's been some uh, air shows in Michigan recently, and those are really uh, fun to watch if you've ever seen them. But uh, with this story uh, about the Wright brothers, I want to come back to that. There's a part that I left out of that history. There's a very significant thing that most people don't know about, but I want to come back to that in a little bit. And we'll come back to that later. So we're going to start here, Matthew 6, 26. And this is the memory verse that the kids were learning this week. So you guys should be familiar with this. It says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are ye not much better than they? Uh, so behold is look. And fowl is just a term for bird. So uh, what I want to focus on, yes, Jesus here, uh, this is the Sermon on the Mount, and he's saying I lo he loves the birds and he loves us and he's going to take care of us. But I want to focus a lot on what he's saying here. He's saying behold the birds of the air. Let's look at the birds. In Job 12, 7, it says, Ask the fowls of the air, and they shall teach thee. So if we look at the birds, they have something to teach us. And I believe uh, there's something we can learn here today. And it's interesting. I was thinking about this in the Bible. Uh, there's uh, many places where it, it talks about looking at things in nature, animals and things of that nature. Um, to, and you learn, and you can learn a lot of things about that. In Proverbs 6.6, 6, it says, Consider the, the ant, uh, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. And it's talking about, it's, it's a good thing to be out there and study the ants and see how hardworking they are and, um, and how they overcome adversity. They don't just, they just keep working hard. And there's places in the Bible that talks about eagles, and eagles are a symbol of strength, endurance, and grace. So we can study nature, and we can, we can learn things for our lives. Okay, so that's where we are. We're going to be looking at the birds and seeing, seeing what they can teach us. Before I do that, this is, I, I wanna, this is, our, um, <laughs> this is our guinea pigs. We just got them uh, early this year, and the, our guinea pig on, the, on your left would be Carmel, and the one on the right is Duke. And... Um, they're just really cute. They're just, they become part of our family. And something I've noticed is, you know, I, I have a hard day at work. Uh, I'm stressed out. I'll go downstairs and I'll just watch them for a while. And I, and I notice after a time, I do feel happier, more content. Um, I, it's hard to explain, but um, the stress kind of goes away. And I think it's because just watching them, they don't have worries. They don't have stress. They're happy. If you give them a little treat, they just jump around and they make cute noises and and so I just think, and, and you, I just believe with looking at animals and, and watching them, you can learn a lot. So I want to jump here, uh, and it, you don't have to turn here in the Bible because I'm going to put 
um, except for one thing later. Uh, everything will be on the screen. Uh, but you can if you like, of course. But we're going to go to Revelation 14.6. And some of you may be familiar with this. This is, um, this is the beginning of the three angels' messages. So we are told that uh, before Christ's return, that these three angels' messages are going to be the most important things for us to understand before, um, before Christ returns. And I would say, too, if you're not familiar, uh, I'll put a plug in there. There's a prophecy seminar coming up this September, I believe. And so I really highly encourage you, if you're, not, if you, if you're uh, interested in prophecy and things like that, understanding Daniel and Revelation, please come to that. Uh, but I'm going to be focusing mostly on the first angel's message, message today. So Revelation 14.6 says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So what's, what it's saying here is that the gospel is uh, going to be preached to the world, right? Revelation 14.7, Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So if you study this, you know there's a lot here. There's a lot to unpack. <clears throat> so I'm not going to be able to um, get to everything here. But I do want to focus in on, on a couple key elements. And what I want to talk about is when we look at the birds, it's a great reminder of God's love as our creator and redeemer. And so... Um, and when I say Redeemer, I'm talking about God wants to save us. And we'll get more into that. There's one more passage I want to look at before I go further. John 10.10 10 says, The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to, des to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they would have it more abundantly. So Jesus here, he is talking about the Pharisees and um, he's making a comparison because the Pharisees were teaching falsehoods, things that weren't true. And I believe what he's saying here is that uh, when we follow things that are false, believe things that are false, that it leads to destruction. But he is saying that there's a better way. And he's saying, if you follow me, you can have life and you can have it more abundantly. Amen? So the abundant life is not just, it's, it's all aspects of us. It's the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. And God wants to heal and make all those better for us. And again, if we follow truth, truth is the greatest um, thing that we can follow. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So Jesus is saying, I am the truth. So if we follow Jesus, that's the truth. John 17, 17 says, thy word is truth. So we know that the Bible is the God's word, and it is true. So if we follow Jesus and we, and we look into his word as our foundation for truth, that we can ha have the abundant life here on earth and we can have life eternal. And one thing I wanted to note, too, about enemies and things like that, thieves, the birds, they have enemies, don't they? They have uh, people, predators, things that come after them. But... It doesn't stop them from doing their job and being happy and, doing their, and singing their songs. And I believe there's a really good lesson there for us as well. Malachi 4.2 says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And here, we're saying about fearing uh, God's name. It's more about reverence. It's more about love. It's not about being afraid, necessarily. It's a, different, it's a different kind of thing there. But again, you see an allusion here to birds and wings, and God wants to wrap us up and heal us and, and again, give us that abundant life. He doesn't want us to be destroyed and to listen to thieves in our lives that will give us falsehoods and things that we don't, that are not true. So I want to go back now to Revelation 14.7 um, and so and I want to point out the, the term two words that really uh, matter here that made 
So worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So we either believe that God made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that we see or we don't. It's, it's one or the other. So do we believe that God is our creator? And the thing about that is in the world today, there's people that will say, no, there is no creator. Everything's just a random accident. And, and, and you see that in the culture, that things are becoming more and more secular. So we have to really ask ourselves, is it true? Is God, did God really make? Is God the creator? And, and it's important. It's important that we understand that we know and believe the truth because that's where the abundant life comes from. So that's, I want to look at this a little bit further, this idea about creator and the creation. And another pop question, uh, pop quiz, what is this? Anyone? Mount Rushmore, thank you. And where's it, who knows where it's at? South Dakota. So if you went to this, if you were in South Dakota, and let's say you were, walk, you were walking around and you didn't know this existed and you saw Mount Rushmore, what would your first thought be that this was designed or that some kind of accident, that some that natural processes, things just happened and it, and it just molded into the faces of these presidents? What would you think? Design, right? So design, I think as humans, we do understand and see and recognize design. Um, and when I think of design, I think of, I think of it like this. If Natural processes, say wind, erosion, whatever it might be, things in nature, the environment can't produce what you're seeing. The most logical explanation is that it, it, that it, it was designed and there was a designer. So I wanted to just show you that to show you where I'm coming from on that. Okay, I'm not going to get too um, deep into this, but um, there's a thing uh, about engineers, and if you're an engineer, I think you, you'll appreciate this, but you'll appreciate it regardless, but engineers need inspiration because uh, engineers create things, they make new things, they use math, science, and things to create, but, um, and, and typically the scientists, what they do is they try to learn about the, the world around them, but engineers are more about creating something new, and so sometimes they, they, they're looking for inspiration. And this is something uh, I find very interesting, something I, I, I study for fun. Uh, but it's called biomimetics, I think I'm saying that right, but it's, it's, it means mimicking nature, or bio-inspiration inspired by design. And um, there's actually a journal called Biomimetics and Bio-inspiration, and it's, it's a very good one if, if you're uh, interested in things like that. And what's happening right now is that um, people are looking into nature to, for designs, for ideas, things like that. And organizations are actually putting a lot of money right now into uh, doing, this, doing this study into nature. Which does beg the question, if they're doing that and there's, they're seeing this amazing design in, in nature, then perhaps it was designed. It's not just apparent. Appears to be designed, but it actually is designed. So I want to give you a couple um, examples, and I could go on and on, but I'm only going to I'm going to give you two here. But Velcro, you remember Velcro? Uh, when I was a kid, I had shoes with the Velcro, and I don't think you see those as much anymore. But the way Velcro was invented was the inventor was home one day, and the dog came in, and he had the dog had a bunch of burrs stuck to him uh, from a burdock plant, and so he took those burrs off. He's like, huh? He asked himself, I wonder what makes this burr stick to the dog. And so he took it under a microscope and looked at it, and he saw in those burrs that there's these little hooks, and those hooks would attach to fabrics or fur and things like that. And that got him thinking, okay, maybe I can make something just like that. And it, that's where he got the idea for Velcro. And here's another one. If you've heard of this, it's the Bombardier beetle. I might be saying that wrong, but I think that's right. And this beetle has a chemical solution that goes around and it sprays out uh, its abdomen and I think it's more of a defense mechanism. But uh, engineers, they started studying this beetle and they started uh, learning uh, for like spray technologies about uh, how to improve distance and droplets and things like that. And so again, they were looking to nature, they were looking to 
to seeing this design and these engineered systems to better make better engineered uh, things in our lives. So with that said, I want to go back to that Wright Brothers story. Because remember, if, if you remember me telling you, there was something I had left out of that story. And at that point, uh, people had been, had been making some strides into flying, and they were getting close, but the, the thing that that was missing was that um, they, d they did not know how to maneuver the plane. So, a and there was a belief at that time that all you had to do was the pilot was just have to shift your, shift your weight, and then all of a sudden you could move around and maneuver, but um, that turned out to turned out to be very dangerous because it's obviously not true. And, um, and I thought this was interesting, but the, there's basically three types of um, movements, maneuvers on planes. The lady that came with the birds, she mentioned this, but there's a pitch and that's like where the nose comes up and the roll, that's, that's more like that. And then yaw, which I didn't understand or know about, but it's just this, where one wing kind of goes in front of the other. So with those three moves, they were thinking, we need to be able to make those three moves. This picture here is from the Greenfield Village in Dearborn. Uh, if you go there, you can see the uh, Wright Brothers uh, house, and you can see their bicycle shop. And this is a picture from inside their home that they grew up in. So the question is, what is missing? Is there something missing when you look at this picture? It's not a trick question, but yeah, it was a long time ago. There was no phones, no laptops, no TVs, no video games, right? But if you look on the left, what do you see there? It's a book, bookcase. So there's a lot of books at their place, and they started reading. So they said, okay, if we want to learn to fly, we're going to need to read. So they, so they started to read a lot about um, flying and flight and things like that. And... Eventually, they got the idea, what if we started reading about the flight of birds? So again, they're looking at design and nature that inspired them. And, and, and when they started learning about birds and the flight and how they use um, their tail feathers and they use their wings in different ways to um, maneuver, they got inspired by that. And that was something that they used to help them um, get their plane off the ground, and that's where you see, saw that picture. So I think it's just pretty amazing, and that's a, a piece of history I think that's been, that's been lost there. Okay, Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So, what it's saying really here is that our creator is so clearly seen in nature and the things that I guess are invisible that people are really without excuse. And design implies a designer. When you see um, engineered system, it implies that there's a master engineer behind what, was, what's, what we see around in the world. So I, we took a little look at creator. God is our creator. I want to look now at God as our Redeemer. So I want to go back now to uh, Revelation 14, 6. And it says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So this gospel is called the everlasting gospel. And it's, um, the gospel is really the good news of a God who loves us beyond what we could imagine. And he wants to save us. And he wants us to be with him for eternity. And um, again, we talked about there are thieves in the world that want to say that there's no creator, that things, life's just a big accident. There's also those that want to say on different, different ways that God, perhaps God doesn't love me. Perhaps God can't forgive me. Perhaps I can't overcome whatever I have going on in my life. But again, I believe that God has truth to combat those, un, those things that are not true. And we can look at the birds again and we can try to uh, see what that truth is. So this one I do would, would like to go to the Bible a little bit. I want to look at a, a story. And it's uh, 1 Kings chapter 17. And 
1 Kings chapter 17. And I'll read it if... Uh, and we're going to be looking at uh, verses 1 through 7. And it says, And Elijah the Tishabite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, we're talking about King Ahab, As the Lord of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. So again, I like, this is a story It involves birds and it shows God's provision, his love for people, for us, especially if we're being faithful. And at that time, King Ahab, he was being wicked and him and uh, his wife Jezebel, they were spreading Baal worship and um, he was, in, in, they were murdering prophets at the time. And um, God told Elijah, go tell him that there's going to be a famine. And there's going to be these things and, um, in the land. And so he did what he was told. They tried to kill him. He ran away. And he, he went by the brook Cherith for, I think, over a year. And the ravens would get, bring him food. And he had water to drink even when, even when the uh, famines came and everything dried up. And I believe it's a wonderful story to show that God does love us and he does care for us. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a wonderful verse. If you don't get anything more from today, this is, try to remember this verse. Um, and it says, For God so loved the world, and we're talking about everybody. So there again, we talk about thieves, that try to destroy, they will say, no, God doesn't love everybody. He only loves a certain few, a certain righteous few. But that's not true. God loves everybody. And that he, began, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And again, whosoever. Salvation is for everybody. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter any of that. God, you can come to God and he will forgive. And for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Condemnation comes from the enemy. God wants us to have the abundant good life. Luke twelve twenty four says, Consider the ravens. And remember, the ravens were what, gave, what brought Elijah the food. During that time, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouses nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And so again, Jesus here is saying, consider the birds, consider the ravens. Remember the stories, remember how he took care of Elijah. And again, it shows God's goodness and love towards us. But even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. So God, again, I don't think we can say it enough. We need to hear it over and over. Uh, God cares about us. He even knows how many hairs are on our, on our head. And it says, fear not, have faith. Uh, one of my favorite verses, probably my favorite, is um, 2 Timothy 1.7. It says, uh, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Ephesians 2, 8-9, so now we're talking about salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So salvation, it, the Bible saying, is a gift. And a gift is something that you receive. It's not something you can purchase. It's not something, there's really nothing you can do except in humility, except that gift. And sometimes... We have a hard time with that because it's, it's such an amazing gift. I was um, 
real quick on this. I, I was reading online that something about a Mega Millions, I guess uh, somebody won it uh, a day or two ago. It got up to $1.3 billion. And I guess somebody won from Illinois, but it's still unclaimed. And so they're, they're talking about what happens if nobody claims it. But it got me thinking about, okay, if I was given a choice between this gift God was giving me and um, this one point, what is it, $3 billion, what would I take? It's just something to think about. But for me, it's just, it's an easy, it's an easy choice. God's gift, there's no, you can't put a price tag on it. Amen. In Christ's righteousness, um, our greatest need as human beings is to feel forgiven. And again, that abundant life that we're talking about, unless we feel forgiven, unless we've been uh, clothed with Christ's righteousness we, um, and walk in that newness of life, we, that's just something we all need. And a lot of us have a hard time because of things we've done, and we have a hard time forgiving ourselves, even though God has forgiven us already. But once we really understand that and let that move into our hearts, it can drastically improve our mental and spiritual health. And one thing about the uh, everlasting gospel, it's, it's not just about forgiving of past sins. God can give you power and strength to overcome whatever you have going on in your life. Um, but you have to be patient. It's not necessarily an overnight thing. It takes a relationship with him, walking with him every day through the power of the Holy Spirit, and he will show you where you need to change in your time. But the trick is to never let go of God's hand. Never let go. No matter what happens, you can always just you can come back. Forgive me, Lord, help me. Show me where I've messed up and help me to do better next time. And eventually, God is going to take us home to heaven when Jesus comes back. So again, we don't want to, we don't want to believe the thieves. We don't want to believe the things in our lives that are not true. We don't want to believe that we can't overcome, that we can't be forgiven, that Jesus is not coming back because all those are true. So all those are true, and we want to make sure we believe that. I'm getting close to the end here, so um, I wanted to throw this out there. There's a book, Steps to Christ. I recommend that for everybody. It's just a wonderful book. It's a short book, 13 uh, chapters. But I, uh, but I think the first one is really important. It's called God's Love for Man. And it's a good one because we really want to make sure that we believe that God loves us. And I've read that, reread it, and sometimes I need to re read it again because uh, it's easy to uh, forget. And here, one of the first lines in this chapter says, look at the wonderful and beautiful things of nature. Again, it's reiterating what Jesus said, to look at the birds and things like that. And so I believe it is important to look at beautiful things. What we see changes us. Uh, I believe it's in 2 Corinthians. It says, what we, what we behold, we become changed. So what we see, what we look at, we become changed. Um, real quick story. I, when I was in, when I was in uh, high school, I, I was on a backpacking trip up in Canada, and I remember uh, one night we, we slept outside, and, I, and the northern lights came out, and I just laid there all night watching the northern lights, and I just, uh, I wasn't really connected much with God at that point, but, it, but I did have an overwhelming sense of that beauty and awe, and I did sense God's love even then. So I do think there is something uh, real powerful about spending time and looking at beautiful things in nature. Steps to Christ, page 10 says, God is love, is written upon every opening bud, upon every spire of sp springing grass, the lovely birds making their air vocal with their happy songs, the delicately tinted flowers and their perfection perfuming the air, the lofty trees of the forest with their rich foliage of living green, all testify to the tender fatherly care of our God and his desire to make his children happy. So again, we see here, God is love. When we see nature, we see design. When we see this beauty, that's God speaking out to us, saying, I love you more than you could ever imagine. And, and he ta calls out the birds here as well. And I'm thankful for their beautiful songs. We love him because he first loved us. Our motivation to come to God is because he loves us so much and we understand that, then we come to him and we love him. It's not about um, fear. It's not about 
I'm afraid of what would happen if I don't. He's, he's reaching out to us through things of nature, through the life of Christ, through the word of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we can be forgiven. 1 John 1, nine says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus says in Hebrews, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we don't have to worry about having our walls up, coming up and seeing, okay, is God going to let me down? God will never let you down. People will. That's just, that's just a fact. Even people in the church. But God will never. And you just keep, to keep your eyes on Jesus. And if you're feeling like you can't be forgiven, that's okay. Um, if you have a sense of your depravity, if you have a sense of your sin, it's actually a blessing because then it makes you lean on God more and depend more on him. And that's actually a blessing. So we are getting close. I wanted to leave you with a, um, this thought here. Uh, in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So there is hope. With God, you keep God in your life, there will always be a good future. There will always be a hope. And so in conclusion, um, the bird's, Nature, everything we see around us does reveal a God who loves us more than we could imagine. He's our creator. He's our redeemer. But we have to be willing to, res- to um, respond to his loving call. And so my prayer today is that everyone here will understand how much God loves you and that you will turn and accept that precious gift and live the abundant life. So, amen.